Uh, it's really nice to be here with good friends, uh, colleagues, new friends. And I have to tell you that while I worked at the Canadian Teachers Federation and looked at issues nationally, I lived in Ontario and before that Saskatchewan. So getting myself immersed in the nuances of BC politics generally or education politics specifically is, um, well, a little discombobulating. It takes a little bit of time. So you, I'm looking forward to tonight for you uh, filling in some blanks for me. I've worked on the issue of uh, privatization and education, been writing about it and doing research for, I think it's well over 20 years now. And I made some big mistakes in the beginning. Maud Barlow and I wrote a book called uh, Class Warfare, The Assault in Canada's Schools, which concluded in a reasonably linear way, picking up information from here and there that privatization in a broad general sense was a really likely outcome of where we were going. When I think about it now, it was kind of linear. Like somehow I imagined we would make this flip from public education to private education. Somebody would announce nationally that you know there would be charter schools, would be vouchers, the teacher's profession would be decimated. None of that really happened. It ended up that the whole process of privatization has been a lot more organic, uh, scattered, diverse, uh, equally fascinating, but harder and harder to describe and keep up with. And I was thinking about that when I was putting together this uh, presentation. I figured you probably didn't want 20 years worth of my research, nor did you want me to repeat stuff I suspect this group already knows about the importance of public education or even <clears throat> embedded in that idea the concept that schools teach power and politics and ideology without trying. It isn't a matter of choosing or not choosing. Schools in their curriculum in the way they organize themselves, in the way they're governed, in the way they're accountable, uh, either challenge existing power arrangements or replicate them. And sometimes a little bit of both. But we don't really have a choice about that. We simply have to live with it. That would be true, of course, of private education as well as public education. So that stuff that I figure we already know, I kind of set that aside and said, I'm not going to beat you over the head with the virtues of what we already all agree with. So I was thinking about, okay, what to do new and different? And I thought, damn it, I'm going to make up a word. So in front of you tonight, for the very first time anywhere, as far as I know, <coughs> is my brand new word called, and it is privatarianism. And I have defined it as the um, ideology of privatization. And I say ideology because back as a sociology student, I learned that an ideology is something that is not subject to fact or verification, right? It's just a belief. So privatarianism is an ideology that believes, despite all evidence to the contrary, that those things which are private are superior to those things which are public. That the private interest can be made synonymous with the public interest. Well, not just can be made, is already synonymous with the public interest. And that uh, nothing is lost and simply everything to be gained by putting more and more things into the private sector. Um, Tim Hudak, the conservative leader in Ontario, whom I hope will be trounced fairly soundly in the next election, uh, recently said that uh, anything that the private sector is willing to do, the public sector shouldn't be in. Now think about that. Kind of reminds me, in, um, uh, Klein in Alberta said 15 years ago, if it's in the yellow pages, the public sector shouldn't be involved. 
I think about that, right? You've got your mental health services, you've got transportation, you have all kinds of health care. The number of things the private sector would like to be involved in as if that is the standard. It would seem to me that that would fit inside privatarianism as an ideology. And then I like that word so much I came up with some spin-offs. Um, the first one being the um, privatariat. You know, they talk about union bosses, right? <laughs> So the privatariat, I figured, is that industry that builds around spreading the gospel of privatarianism. So like the Fraser Institute and then, God, I can think of a couple of political parties, I don't know about you, that would fit in that category. Uh, think tanks, op-ed columnists, Kevin O'Leary. Think of the people we could put in that column. But that isn't just everybody. And then my, my favorite word of the whole cluster is uh, the privatocracy. And I figure that's the 1% or the one-tenth of 1% that is really reaping the benefits of privatarianism and uh, in continuing to encourage and, in, and fund the privatariat to go ahead with the gospel of privatarianism. So uh, that's our new concept of the night. As I mentioned, the, um, the whole business of privatizing education isn't so much an event as it is a process and a way of thinking. If I think my school is better than yours because of test scores, it really doesn't matter who governs that school, whether it's private or public. I have internalized the notion of comparison and competition. I've internalized privatarianism to some extent. Um, about 20 years ago, I got a phone call from, uh, as it happens, ooh, how excited, <laughs> big CBC listener like me. They wanted me on, and you know what the big event was that was worthy of national attention on As It Happens? Someone had put an ad for bubblegum on the outside of a school bus in Manitoba. That was national news, right? Now that kind of thing is so normalized, the exposure of our kids to that kind of advertising that it is no longer an event, it's a process. It's a way of thinking about the purposes of education, what's acceptable, what's normal, what's inevitable, what's unavoidable. And of course, it's a natural complement, privatized education, to other kinds of privatarianism. I mean, the idea that we could normalize privatized health care and abnormalize privatized education doesn't make much sense, does it? Right? A neoliberal, libertarian, privatized philosophy necessarily includes education, if for no other reason than it uh, occupies such a sizable part of our economy and public spending. But such a sizable and important part of how we come to learn what it means to be a citizen in our society. I mean, if you're really serious about neoliberalism, or privatarianism, you got to get to the kids early. It's really as simple as that. What you come to believe about matters, what you come to believe about individual virtue and effort triumphing o over decades of oppression, as seems to be a common narrative around Idle No More, I mean the people who are writing in at the bottom of the Globe and Mail websites, about lazy Indians are frankly either learning that somewhere or not having that challenged somewhere, that very important idea. Education is vital to any political project, neoliberal or progressive. The other thing I want to say is that privatizing to the extent that let's say you get get a group of citizens and parents together and say, but we need a charter school here. You know, they aren't interested in supporting the privatariat. 
They aren't part of the 1% often. They are just so goddamn frightened that their kids are not going to make it. And it's really difficult because it's easier for me to fight against people I believe are deeply wrong and evil than it is to fight people who I believe are acting out of love and fear and powerlessness. And a lot of what you hear around privatization, particularly as it's, it's manifested in it rushing forward in the US, is coming from parents of kids who haven't just not been served by their schools and teachers, they haven't been served by their society. Right? So that's a, that's a real tough one for us to keep in mind when we think about strategies. Um, Privatizing is also a means to achieve diverse goals of diverse ideologies. Back when I was working on class warfare, what was really interesting and harder to track, right? This is like kind of primitive internet stuff, was how religious fundamentalism and venture capitalism and libertarianism were overlapping. If I really believe my kids are entitled to their own section of heaven. It isn't much of a jump to believe they're entitled to their own schools. If I believe my child is likely to be contaminated by yours because he or she has different ideas, if I legitimately believe that, then the guy beside me who says, hey, I've got a charter school proposal that will let you and your kind set up your own school, and he's a venture capitalist, like we're friends all of a sudden, right? And if you're just an anti-government zealot who doesn't believe the government should be involved in raising children, a libertarian, there you go. And someone who believes their child has such special needs that they will never survive in a regular school, there's another ally. So it's really interesting, right, how the allies overlap from the most mercenary to the most powerless and can say, okay, you've convinced me. I guess public education is the problem and privatization is the solution. Um, I was thinking about the zeitgeist, the, char the main characteristics of the context in which privatization flourishes. And the first one that came to mind, I was trying to do these in one word, uh, was distraction. Neil Postman, um, who was just amazingly prescient about uh, education, society, technology. He's a cultural theorist, wrote wonderful things. Neil Postman wrote uh, when his 1971 book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, um, was reissued, republished in 1985, and he wrote a new preamble to it. And the year 1985 is important. Uh, the book itself was really um, concerned that technology was risking dumbing us down. In 1971, the average American child watched television, that new intrusive technology, for 30 minutes a day. And of course now screen time, although it's getting harder to measure because kids have several screens in front of them at once, but screen time is estimated to be between 30 and 40 hours a week. So it was his 1971 observation that uh, we were going to be in trouble. So the idea that we participate in our own powerlessness, our addiction to distraction, our endless fascination for being amused, if not true for the people who made the effort to come out here this evening. Um, I think we can all recognize that that is one of the things that is allowing us to drift into whatever comes next. Uh, another part of the zeitgeist, oh, another new word I came up with, econotheism. Um, we could have a little workshop in defining that, but it seems to me that thou shalt have no other god before the economy 
comes pretty close to being the first commandment of ecotheism. That um, what we do, whether it violates the Charter of Rights and Freedoms or not, whether it disadvantages some groups, whether it uh, causes people to die or the environment to die, if it supports the economy, it is ipso facto justifiable. Um, you know, I lived in Ottawa too long, but if I hear anyone from the Harper government again answering any question about justice, about liberty, about human rights with saying jobs, prosperity, uh, and the economy. <clears throat> well, I could send them this presentation, <laughs> I guess, would be the result. But it is interesting, right, how it has become a pretty well unquestionable tenet that we simply must do it. We must pump it out of the ground now. We must sell it now. We must, you know the story. I don't need to go into that. But econotheism as a applied to education means that everything else that we teach and the way in which we finance and support and who gets to learn, all of those questions are really subject to, okay, how does it affect the economy? Now enter something called Partnership for 21st Century Skills. This is an international movement. Um, technically uh, philanthropic, but essentially a way for um, hundreds of technology and venture capital corporations to launder their money um, and transform education into a model of skills development. Yes, thank you very much. So this is the kind of thing that you will see. You've heard about it uh, in British Columbia. I know it is um, more prevalent in other parts of the country. But you see the linkage, the automatic linkage of today's students and tomorrow's workforce. Now here's P21 describing the purpose of education. Every aspect, pre-K to 12, Everything, including teacher preparation programs, must be aligned to prepare citizens with the 21st century skills they need to compete. Now, skills is um, Orwellian speak, double speak for uh, employability. Right? Same thing. Now, look at the second line. I think it's really interesting. This is from the same brochure that I showed you the cover of in the last. The sharp rise in inequality of the last several years was largely due to an educational slowdown. Now, of the many things that you could, conclusions you could come to about the causes of the increasing rate of inequality uh, in developed countries, particularly in Canada and the US, to blame it on education strikes me as incredibly smarmy and manipulative doublespeak um, at its finest. Here's the Canadian version of it. Um, this is a conference that was held uh, at York University. The 21st century learning envelope uh, intended to strengthen the connection between education and, bid and business. This is the second conference. Uh, and if you can see down far enough at the bottom, sponsored by Able Discovery Education, ISDE, da da, Pearson Canada, oh, and York University, your tax dollars, supporting this particular project. Now, this is from the BC Ministry of Education. This is 21st century boiled down. And I actually appreciate this because they all have better spin writers than some of the American and international stuff. They at least, you know, give a uh, voice to um, lip service to skills of citizenship and, you know, participation in global community and blah, blah. No, that's really straight in the BC stuff. Like, let's just get it out there. 21st century learning. Students use educational technologies, et cetera, et cetera. And again, emerging technologies. And you see how point number three, how choice is integrated s pretty seamlessly 
into the idea of technologies. That's really quite fascinating. That, that's from their website. Um, there's a video which I tried to capture and couldn't that I really wanted to show you that is the, have you seen it Larry? The most mindless piece of it doesn't even really qualify as propaganda. Propaganda would be more subtle. It's like shooting arrows and stuff and geometric diagrams that supposedly convinces you that retooling everything in favor of educational technology is what 21st century education will be about. It's, you've seen it too? <laughs> Scary. Here are some of, some of the companies that are behind 21st century skills. It's only part of the list, trust me. Which really fits into Technopoly. Nearly all of the corporations that you saw there um, are technology companies one way or another. Uh, most of those companies are active in running chains of charter schools teacher education, testing, curriculum, and everything, and believe me, lobbying. I believe the ETS, Education Testing Services, actually has more lobbyists than employees. ETS runs a great deal of the standardized testing that takes place over the U.S. And the other thing to remember about these companies, you have to have uh, BC Ministry of Education and many other ministries of education um, buying into your vision of skills and preparing the necessary legislation, changing teacher education requirements and so forth in order for this to happen. So it is iterative and a compounding effect, both in people's understanding that Oh my God, that's what my kid needs. He needs more screen time. Why didn't I realize that before? You know, all the way up to lobbying a ministry official that says, oh yeah, I think we should outsource some of this curriculum development. I don't see why we can't have every kid in grade 10, 11, and 12 do at least one course online. Right? I mean, <laughs> it all has to fit together seamlessly, as they say in technology. So Technopoly, that is a, not my made-up word, that's a Neil Postman's made-up word, which is about the triumph of technology and our reluctance for multiple reasons uh, to challenge that it must be, it has to be, we have no choice. It simply develops, it's a tool, oh, it's a tool, but we have to use it. And I'm reminded of one of my favorite quotes from Ursula Franklin. Um, a wonderful engineer and cultural theorist who talked about technology and she said, if technology is a tool and not our God, then we can decide when to set it aside. We set aside slavery even though it was a useful tool. Right? I mean, if it is a tool, presumably we have some choice. Technopoly implies that we are powerless in the face of technology. We have no choice except how fast, how much, and how far can we go. Uh, the whole question of the role of technology in classrooms is um, a completely different bubble, in a way, from this lecture. But extremely important for us to talk about, and with the exception of Larry and his blog, which does a fine job on it, uh, the number of people critically talking about technology in the classroom seems to be diminishing all the time. Um, we don't have a lot of independent research on what's the effect on our kids. If you're doing your math on an iPad, how is it different from doing your math on a piece of paper? I mean, maybe it's better, but I'm not going to believe it just because Apple tells me so. And most of our research about technology in the classroom, it has been corporations who've been telling us that it's beneficial. Uh, and now that it's been in our classrooms for 20 years, and as far as I know, Nona said, Eureka, my God, look at the international gains we've made in student achievement over the last 20 years. Well, I haven't been hearing that. 
No. But the whole business of um, the impact on classrooms, how often and at what expense it would take to upgrade our technologies, just to consider one strand of what to think about, you know, year after year. So you got an iPhone 4S classroom. What happens when they go to five? What happens when they go to seven? I, I, yeah, I mean, it seems to me a race uh, that we're very unlikely to keep up with. Uh, and it's really not surprising that the Bill Gates Foundation is one of the philanthropies most involved in promoting 21st century learning and, of course, uh, technology in the classroom. I do wish we had more choices. If I got, oh yeah. Okay, ignore that one. We're going to this one. This is really interesting. I could not capture this in the interactive way it is on screen, but anybody who's interested, this is the best uh, ed tech corporate thing I've ever seen. It comes from, let me go back here because I've got the name of it. Um, This is the introduction to the page. Uh, it's Education Ventures. This is a venture capital group. And among other things that they do for their clients is provide them with this map. So this map goes on several layers deep when you click on it. And you can find all the companies doing all this work in the education business. So if you're an investor, or if you want someone to do that for your school. Um, now, I like the headings. We've got curricula over here. So if you click from curricula to online instruction, then 30 little bubbles come up, and you can click on all of them, and they subdivide into who's doing math online stuff. Um, games, of course. Courses, tutoring. Well, we know who's big into the tutoring business, don't we? Oh, and there's kind of a new kind of tutoring going on now. I read about when I was in Ottawa last week. About half of Ottawa elementary schools are now offering recess enrichment. <laughs> Different courses. Courses you can take in morning recess and noon recess. Science, art, music, how to use the library at about eight dollars per kid per recess cash to the school written on a check to the school and private companies are coming in and doing it so they would fit in there somewhere maybe under curricula i don't know now what i like of all the, all the categories up there the names for them don't you like talent management that would be your teachers that would be your teacher training <laughs> That would be your teacher evaluation. That would be your video systems to monitor teachers. Observations. Yeah, observations. PD systems. Larry, we don't have to do PD anymore. PD systems, you really, I, I was so, I must have spent three hours trying to get that, but they've got it embedded in something that I can't copy, despite having spent 20 bucks downloading a new program. Uh, but it really is worth seeing. Isn't that fascinating? Represented there are probably 200 companies. And when you finally get down to a company, it'll tell you which school system has bought their product. Uh, by the way, uh, this is listed uh, on the website. Remember I gave you the other page there as a philanthropy. It's a philanthropic organization dedicated to the education of underprivileged students around the world. Talk about Newspeak, people. <laughs> right? The fact that it isn't filing a tax return does not make it a philanthropy. <laughs> it just makes it a source to pool venture capital money and promote and lobby an ideology of um, technocentric education. Now here, Larry, you're going to re- uh, maybe you've seen this one, you're going to really like this one. This is the biggest player, Pearson Education. I'm not going to play the whole thing. You can go find this video for yourself. 
provider of everything we've been talking about. All those little bubbles that we saw there before, they've got their fingers in every single one of them. And they have their fingers in the pie in BC. They want to be the leading education company in the world, if they aren't already. And here they are welcoming you to their benign world. Does anybody like the Pleasantville at the back there? Is that what it reminds you of? It's just so creepy. Is this a real place? No, it's not a real place, but it is a real concept. And the idea that, that it's Pearsonville, right? It isn't just Pearson the company. It is a, a, a way of living. Yes, thank you. It's a, it is a complete environment. Scares. Now, let's see. Okay, stop. So, um, BC Education, when it came out with its blueprint for 21st century learning, now they use the word learning instead of skills, as if you're, we're all going to be filled, fooled by the differentiation. And students were asked, uh, the announcement was made to students, apparently, I don't know, you can tell me this, but teachers are like not in favor in BC, something like that? So, it, <laughs> so instead of coming out with their bold new projection uh, to teachers or the general public, they went to students. And the students asked the question, this is a fascinating brochure, what will learning be like in the 21st century? Now, it was 2011 when they did this? Like, are we not in the 21st century? Does it not? <laughs> you could maybe ask about the 22nd century, but whatever. Now, I thought the student responses were fascinating. They were actually pretty skeptical, more skeptical than most adults have been. But students were unanimously agreed there would be no more textbooks, paperless environment. Yeah, OK. Lessons that could be downloaded. And then I like this. The role of the teacher would change as well. Teacher would be a mentor, or less as a giver of knowledge. Teachers as a guide. Several of the groups thought that there might be robotic versions of the traditional teacher. <laughs> the artificial intelligence could present lectures where student response or input was not desired. Now, I was thinking about that last sentence. <laughs> what kind of teaching does not desire <laughs> student response or input. That was quite fascinating. Uh, more from students. They wanted online tutors. Students had concerns about the structure of schools in general. If teachers became mentors or robots, and all information can be found by anyone anytime, does that sound like anybody's advertising slogan? What would our schools look like? Now, I like this comment, interesting contradiction. With regard to social interaction, students do not seem to value the school building as a social structure. In fact, if students had access to technology at home, the need for the building itself was quite diminished. Like, get rid of the middle manny, just bill the parents mm -hmm. for the lessons. They do it all online, and apparently students no longer see. Well, I mean, I want to believe that isn't true, and I'm terrified that it might be true, that something that has happened at schools and with technology and distraction, all the other stuff we've been talking about, in fact, school, in that big place that it has in our minds and hearts, the thing we still dream about, 45 years after we left school. Come on, who here still has school dreams? You turned up late for a test, you're naked, right? Come on! <laughs> like, that, that big spot maybe isn't there anymore for kids. I don't believe that. I hope not. But it's a, I mean, it's a great discussion topic, whether or not it, it still holds that role. But apparently, BC, 21st century learning, they are using the student responses to drive the adoption of the plan. Now this is from the American version of, of um, uh, Century 21 skills. 
I was preparing a paper for uh, a conference in Boston. And I was looking across stuff, and 21st century stuff was pretty new. And you're going to see the slide that I found next. But this was part of an essay in an online class, teacher education class, master's level. And I guess it was some kind of general essay about 21st century curriculum and what it would mean. And this is what the teacher wrote, the picture. It's changing everything. Many of these titles I do not know anything about, but I would guess many of my students could teach me about them. So now she's not just being a tutor or a guide, right? Her idea is that her students could get all their curriculum from these sources. Those are all just logos. And I know they're fuzzy, but like, what does it matter? So imagine pasting that into your paper on a class on what your curriculum should look like in the 21st century. And I thought, who is this person? So I started stalking her. <laughs> like I found the name and I found the university class and I went on Facebook and I started looking and I found her. Perfectly nice ordinary looking teacher and I saw her wedding pictures and then I saw her baby pictures and I just felt like crap Because I truly believe this is someone who doesn't need to think like this and I do not know how to get to her I do not know how we get to her. I Don't know what to give her instead That seems at least as superficially appealing as this list of websites. Okay, oh, I'm going a long time here, people. I'll wrap, try to wrap up quickly. Um, trying to decide what to call this column, and I decided duplicity would do it, which is a really nice 75 cent word for dying, <laughs> right? Lying to others, lying to ourselves, obfuscation. Uh, I don't know about you, but I feel like I'm being lied to more and more and more. It is more and more confusing to know whether what you just heard in the news or read in the paper bears any relationship at all to the truth. But it isn't just lying in that kind of, I'm putting one over on you way. I also put the whole category of the zeitgeist in the acceptance of faulty reasoning, um, right? Presenting an argument in which the conclusion clearly does not follow from the premises. Doing it ourselves and expecting other, ac accepting the fact that other people will do it as well. Um, ignoring cause and effect. Who listened to CBC morning, yesterday morning, maybe the morning before, they're talking about standardized testing, about the, what are, okay. All right, who was, see, I don't know um, BC politics enough, well enough to know who, to whom I was listening, but said, you know, yeah, we're going to tinker with the standardized tests because there were all of these unintended consequences, like people would, com would compare schools. And I went, liar, liar, pants on fire. We told them, Larry, 20 years ago, we said, if you start doing this, this is what the consequences will be. And this is what will happen to the curriculum. And this is what will happen to your teachers. And this is what, we, right? The denial of plausible cause and effect, it seems to me, is part of duplicity among the powerful. The right to say, oh, that'll never happen, simply because you don't want it to happen, um, is, a, is a right of the powerful and not one that, um, that we can easily interrupt. When I heard uh, in that same interview, both McCray, who is the present minister, and Jerry Musio, who used to be a deputy minister back in ah, the 80s. Okay, thank I you. Think that's who you that, that's about. probably who I heard. One of them said, We think we'll keep it because parents like it. 
like didn't say this is accurate information didn't say student evaluation is the same thing as system evaluation <laughs> which of course is false um, but the idea that if you liked something it was valid was really an astonishing thing to hear from it all fits in that category of duplicity for me uh, and the more I'm told that black is white, the more I think about Orwell and the more I want to go back and read, or rather Huxley, uh, and read what he had to say on that depressing subject. War, the duplicity includes finding scapegoats, of course, finding other people to blame. Uh, war on teachers, I need not say a lot about in this group, I'm sure. This is Henry Giroux, a wonderful education theorist who um, departed the U.S. and is now at w uh, Windsor? McGill? McGill? Yeah, now at a Canadian university. Um, and he's absolutely right. Teachers are the new welfare queens. Isn't that a great line? Right. How, when what we have is reduced, we start going after each other and are encouraged to. This I thought was interesting. This is from the Venture Guys again. Big problem with public education in America doesn't affect my kid. If you had to boil down this year's PDK Gallup poll down to a sentence, that might be it. Now, this is really interesting. It's been one of the impediments to privatization of education, both here and in the US. And that is public satisfaction with schools. Despite the attempt to manufacture mass dissatisfaction, those who know schools well, whose kids go to school, whose grandchildren go to school, who've been teachers, who are recent graduates, the closer you are to a real school, the more positively you feel about it. And that comes through, both in the US and Canada, when you do public opinion surveys. Now, when you ask, mm, so like rank your school compared with others in your city, Nearly everybody figures their school is way better than those in the city and vastly superior to those in the province or country or another country. So that gap is really best explained by propaganda. What else would explain it? That somehow we, we are being convinced that and we need to be told by venture capitalists that our kids are not doing as well as our own personal children are not doing as well at school as we think they are. So, it really sets up. Now, this is a new term. Come across this one. Education reformers apparently were getting a bad name. So now, the new catchphrase in education, if you want to be really great, you have to be an educational disruptor. They're now giving awards out instead of teacher of the year education disruptor of the year. Now, can you imagine winning the prize as the healthcare disruptor of the year? <laughs> I mean, it's really quite astonishing. Uh, this is Giroux again talking about reformers and not reformers, they're reactionaries and mercenaries. And I like what he says at the end. It's not just teaching for conformity but turning students into compliant subjects, unable to think critically about themselves and their relationships in a larger world. And I wouldn't want to put all the blame on schools for that. But the whole business of supporting critical thinking without asking the question, what shall we think critically about? <coughs> critical thinking about a business problem and critical thinking about how ought people to organize themselves for the good are two entirely different questions. What is worth knowing and who gets to learn it are deeply political questions. Who gets to challenge conventional wisdom and what happens to them when they do that? Those are questions of power dynamics in school that ought to engage us a whole lot more than how many laptops there are in the library. We gotta figure out a way to get there.
And finally, in the zeitgeist, as I'm sure many of you are aware, the tolerance for inequality. It's not just growing inequality, it's the tolerance for it. It's the blaming people who are less equal. It is the jealousy of those who are slightly more equal than we are. And the willingness to let the system, by and large, off the hook. I'm really proud of the work that CCPA and many other groups have been doing on inequality and it has been fascinating to see it move on to the agenda in the last couple of years. Fascinating to see how the streets are putting it on the agenda when our pie charts and carefully researched reports and press releases have not done so. I don't want to think they're separate things. I want to believe that mm, Ursula Franklin used to say it's the um, earthworm theory, earthworm model of social change. There are those of us who chop up pieces of paper and turn it into compost and put it down on the ground for the earthworms and they chew it up and they chew it up and, they, and then they arise. <laughs> and I like, I like that idea. I like to think that we have helped with that. Of course, inequality raises uh, opportunities for or the specter of charity, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, we talked more about charity than I have tonight at the last meeting. I see. The disguise of philanthropic organizations and charitable organizations, particularly around their influence of international education reform, is really something to be keeping an eye on. Um, Something, it, you know, it was Time or Newsweek, not exactly a radical magazine, referred to Bill Gates as a de facto Secretary of Education in the U.S. Because the Gates Foundation unaccountably, unbelievably unaccountably, uh, makes so many decisions about the directions of education reform and where things will be tested. Um, question that I think is really important to keep in front of our minds when we're dealing with charities, charitable organizations, individuals, is not, is this a good person? But is this a good idea? Does it make sense to have our schools adopted? How come they are orphans in the first place? Why are our schools suffering for funding? Does it make sense to set up a charitable model um, big questions with tough immediate consequences like and downloaded to the least powerful. I personally don't want to be the teacher and the principal in the staff room debating the question of whether or not we should accept a breakfast program. That is not the level for that policy debate and it's completely unfair to download it to that level. Completely unfair. That's not where the consequences ought to be felt. Well, we talked about funding. When we talk about supporting public education, <coughs> making sure that what schools do is not eroded to the point that they end up deserving the criticism that is hurled at them. Long but important sentence. It's partly about keeping the funding there. And from BC <coughs> TF figures, for BC to meet the average, student-teacher ratio, 5,800 more full-time equivalent teachers. For BC to meet the Canadian average of terms of funding as a percentage of GDP, $609 million. Big numbers, not impossible. It's really hard to believe that one of the wealthiest countries in the world can, with a straight face, claim to not be able to educate the kids that we serve. This was special needs. One of the things I read just before I came here tonight that one of the fasting gro fastest growing areas of uh, privatization in education, special needs. Apparently autism is a growth sector. And you know what? I don't want to turn the education of kids with autism over to people who believe autism is a growth sector. 
as opposed to a way to serve kids. So of all the things we have tried to do, some of them successful, some of them less successful, I have not run across this one and I thought maybe for an upbeat moment I'd end with this last video. Um, two teachers and a microphone have a whole series of homemade videos they do to motivate teachers around education issues. The little bit of context here, um, it's an open letter to Arnie Duncan, who was the um, education secretary in the U.S. and the architect of a great deal of privatization in the U.S. He's a basketball player, not a teacher, at least that was his previous job. And they're also talking about No Child Left Behind, which you're probably familiar with, which uh, Obama is continuing, just in case you harbored any expectations about the Obama administration reversing some of what's going on in education in the U.S. I would not keep your hopes up. Anyway, I'd love to hear from anybody who has something to say. Well, before we do that, maybe just a round of applause for that. Thank you. Thank you.